Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Poultry Keepers 360 Live. Hey, are you ready for Flock Shock? You know, I got to thinking about it today after I had come up with that title for the show tonight, and I thought, ooh, that would have been a good thing to do uh, for Halloween, but <laughs> too little, too late, I guess. But at any rate, we want to share with you some of the minor uh, stress factors and some of the unusual stress factors uh, your birds might encounter, some that I'll be willing to bet that you've never even thought about before. So coming up in just a few seconds, Jeff Maddox and I are going to have at it. Hail, hail, the gang's all here. It's myself and Jeff and Karen, and we are loaded for bear tonight, y'all. Good times, good times. You know, Jeff and I were talking uh, the other day that when we came up with this idea about unusual stress factors, and, you know, we realized, talked about it, there's really not too much that does stress the chicken out. Uh, it just depends on to the degree, but the, the degree that it happens. And I thought it would be good if we started off kind of reviewing some of the more common stress factors just to make sure everybody's up to speed on those. Jeff, let's talk about some of the minor stress factors that are more common. Um, and I want to get your thoughts on them, but feed changes, for example, um, it can be small, small changes, but it can, it can affect our birds. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, right. I mean, even little changes, right? Changing brands, for instance, um, sometimes it can go perfectly fine, right? You, you can switch from, you know, neutrino all flock to Purina flock maker. Um, as long as the color doesn't change and the size doesn't change, but you know, look, your birds actually can smell better than you give them credit for, right? Yeah. yeah oh, they yeah. got small nostrils and they got a lot less taste buds than we do. Um, but <clears throat> You know, if you make a bad change, like all of a sudden, one of the worst things you ever want to do is you've been using the same feed for the last 10 years to say you run out, right? You go down to tractor supply or wherever you get your feed and they're out. And now you've got to take, you're going to gamble on something completely different that you've never even tried before. And you're going to get it home and your birds are going to look at you like, are you stupid? Right. And you know, and, and they may, may not eat it, right? That first day. Um, I've, I've experienced you know. that, yeah. So uh, while you don't really see the stress on the chicken, the chicken is being stressed at that point. It, it's probably more stressful for you because you're like, what am I going to do now, right? And that's kind of what your chicken's thinking, right? Okay, what do you want me to do with this? And, um, you know, so size changes, color changes, um, smell changes, you know, while it doesn't seem like it's a big deal for us, it's still a gamble. It's still a stress. Okay. Um, sometimes you get lucky and they, they never notice it. And next time, you know, my cousin called me one day, right? <clears throat> Kept, you know, backyard layer flock, you know, just common. And he had been using this, you know, really nice coarse textured mash feed, not pelleted. Well, they didn't have any. So he came home with you know, a commercial brand. I think at the time it might've been Kambach, you know, just their layer feed. And he put that in the feeder and his laying hands went on strike. They, for two days, they would not eat those pellets, right? Because of the change of appearance, size, and smell, you know, they wanted nothing to do with that, right? He called me, he's freaking out. And I'm like, huh? you know, all you can do is get some mash feed to go with it you know, and transition them over. As soon as they got mash feed back in stock, he went back to the mash. His hens were happy. He was happy and, you know, life was good again. But, um, yeah, so feed changes are, are, are a thing for a chicken. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of people are aware about the change in appearance, but not too many are aware of the change in smell. And like you said, chickens can smell Gosh, I wish they were big as a dog. You could tree coons with them, but um, yeah, uh, 
Uh, you know, I wish people would actually smell their chicken feed. When you first open your bag of chicken feed and, and, you know, look, because I get to talk to so many folks out there, right, throughout the poultry industry, you know, um, people say, you know, I opened, I didn't smell anything. Well, that's not good. You know, you, you, it should yeah. have a smell. And was it a good smell to you or was it not a good smell, right? And if it doesn't smell good to you, why do you, why do you think your chicken's even going to want to eat it if it doesn't have a good smell to it? But yeah, I remember for years that I didn't, if I detected a smell from the feed, it was usually a musty smell, which I, you know, you, yeah. you definitely don't want. Right. You don't, you know, I mean, the older it gets, uh, but if you, if you get no smell at all, that means that feed is really old. You want to look at that manufacturing date, or it is so full of byproducts that there's no actual grain left in it to have a good smell. So, you know, um, those are the top two reasons I get no smell. You definitely don't want a musty smell because then moisture has gotten to it and, you know, it's starting to turn on you. <clears throat> Yeah, feed, you know, to me, feed is somewhat of a minor because you can fix that, you know, a little bit quicker than some of the other stresses we're going to talk about tonight. Well, yeah, we talked about the appearance of feed, but what about the appearance of people? <laughs> people don't even realize this, right? So if you're the same, if the same person goes out every day to feed and water, you know, chickens get used to you or that person now you know if the whole family goes out that's great because then they get used to pretty much seeing everybody and they, they become a familiar face but let's say your family goes on vacation and you got somebody strained you know you got a neighbor or somebody taking care of your chicken for you i can't tell you how many phone calls i get when when people get back and they say you know, my egg production is down half of what it was before I left, and, and I got three sick hens, and I got this. And I, you know, I mean, so, uh, changing who does the chores is is stressful on a chicken, right? They don't trust strangers. You know, it's like it, it, it's like your pet dog, right? If your dog goes in with you to feed, you know, the chickens once a year, that's a problem. If your dog's yeah. always with you, yeah. right, if it's a familiar face, they learn to trust it, it, it's not as stressful. But as soon as you bring a strange dog in there, you know, let's say somebody's visiting and the dog goes with you to the coop, you know, it, it just stresses them out. So it's anything, anything that changes in their environment, can, it will be a stressor, you know, um, you know, feed, lights, you know, um, it, it, what you're putting in the water, changing your water, all of that, you know, t depending on how big the change is, will determine how big the stress is. But um, uh, what else did we have in, you know, the lesser, somewhat important stressors? Um, one thing that I think some folks may know, they may not, but what about competition for nesting space? Oh. They don't even, people don't even think about it, right? And, and actually, some people get a little bit of a kick out of, you know, or find humor in that it's easy to gather the eggs because 20 hens, 18 of the 20 eggs are all in one nest box, right? But they don't realize that there's competition. They're not out there watching their birds when the laying's occurring, and there's competition for that nest box, right? And you got two old hens that are just bickering at each other and fighting and carrying on because they want to get in there and lay that egg. Boy, have I so, seen that. Well, but not everybody listening to the show is home when that happens to get right. to see it, right? right? Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, listening to two or three or even four hens, depending on how big your flock is, fighting for that one nest box, that. It, you know, it's it's as bad as two roosters fighting. I'm telling you what. I mean, it's it, not worse. It, it can get pretty ugly out there in a hurry. And, um, but yeah, so what, you know, where I, are you? I nest, yeah, huh? Okay. I, I was just going to say, what can folks do to to help overcome that, or is there anything they can do? Well, I mean, 
you know, I, I think most people have enough nest space or enough, mm -hmm. um, you know, places to lay, but hens inevitably are looking for the darkest location in the morning hours, right? Between 8 and 10 a.m., they're kind of all competing, you know, to lay their egg. They're all looking mm -hmm. for that darkest spot. Um, so some of the easy tricks that I've seen, if you have multiple whole nest boxes is, you know, putting dividers because if you, if you get time to watch your birds, you go out there and you, and the hen will jump up on the perch rail and she'll walk down the perch rail looking yep. in every hole and she's looking for the other eggs. Now, if you put a divider there, so she can't run down the perch rail, you created an artificial corner right? And she'll duck in there. So if just a couple of artificial walls or corners, um, dividers can, will spread out where your eggs are laid. What about curtains? Oh, you gotta have, you gotta, uh, gotta have curtains. I mean, <clears throat> there's no delicate way to say this. I'm going to probably, you know, I might upset somebody, but look, <clears throat> for the ladies who are listening, when you've had children, would you not want a little bit of privacy? And these hens are looking for that privacy. They want to feel secure where they're laying that egg, okay? So they're looking for that darkest place for concealment. They're, tr they're trying to hide it. They want to be alone. And I, honestly, 70% of the, of the, you know, coops that I go into, you know, got those old nest boxes in them, you know, multi-hole nest boxes. And there's no curtains on them. Right? You just need to come up with a better word. You need it because curtains is what throws you, right? Like I don't want curtains on my. You know what I mean? Like you need to. It needs to be shade cloths, nest box covers, something other than the word curtain. <laughs> well, make it seem like you're year, years sewing. ago. Nest boxes used to come with those. Yeah, and yeah. they called them nest curtains. I know. Yeah. I just. It is the proper term, even if you go look at best nest box or hen gear or whatever. Right, they're still called curtains, but uh, yeah, okay. there's a couple of blogs out there that have changed it into you know gingham, you know things you're sewing and changing <laughs> for the seasons. And <laughs> well, I mean, you know, okay, so the light blockers should always be there, okay, <laughs> um, or the privacy um, yeah, the shields, it's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, should always be there um, year round. You know, and you want something that you can lift up temporarily, you know, tuck it up out of the way. So when you have young birds that are still learning where to lay, how to lay, things like that, they find those nest boxes more easily. And once you see that they're using them well, then you can, you know, you can drop down the privacy curtains and, and go back to. All right. I'm, I'm going to put this comment up because I think Rob read it the same way I did because I thought you were saying competition for roosting space versus nesting space but i'm assuming it's pretty similar right um uh, usually usually i don't the only time i have problems with roosting spots is when you mix new birds into the flock and they don't know where they're sleeping right it's amazing you know when when i had my observation group you know in the backyard you know i'd go out and look and this hen was always beside this hen and this hen was here and this hen was here, right? They had their place and they always slept in the same place. And if somebody was in the wrong spot, they would fight over it. Okay. There was a fighting issue for, you know, where they were going to roost. Um, so when you add new birds into the flock or you rearrange the social order <clears throat> you're going to have for roosting. But what I meant is the perch rail in front of the nest box. So, Many most nest boxes that you purchase have a railing in front of it that the bird flies up on to go in and lay their egg. Um, so, you know, not not the homemade nesting boxes that we see, you know, people making these days, but you know, almost any type of commercial nesting box will have a perch rail on it, uh, you know, for the bird to jump up on. That I yeah, but I still think you're even what you're describing even is now maybe you're saying that they only have to fight over that spot one time and then it's subtle. But I mean, if you've got oh. that ladder type roost, I mean, if you oh, watch oh, wait, them, wait, it, wait. It, no, yeah. I got rid of the I don't do the ladder roost. Yeah. I, I learned early on that there's no ladder roost. Yeah. Um, I, I ended up going to a socialistic government out there. 
and all were on the all were level. That yeah. roosting that roosting platform was completely level. Yeah. Because yes, when I had the angled ladder roost, yeah. there was horrible fighting every night for Maybe the right. top spot. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever they go in first, and then yeah. when they get it, and then the next birds come in and knock I'm, them off, and yeah. So yeah. I, I I made I made my roosting bars level all at three foot high, and then once I did that, then. 80% of the fighting went away. Then it was everybody had to figure out where their sleeping spot was and everybody was happy. So Jeff, I learned about that when I was probably about, I don't know, 11 or 12 years old. There was an older gentleman lived up North of us and he raised, he had uh, floor layers, probably about five or 600 Rhode Island red floor layers. And I was, walking around up there one day and I noticed that all of his roosting bars were level on the same level. And I asked him about that. And he looked at me like I had lost my mind. He said, well, don't you know that stops the squabbling and fighting at roost? Yep. No, I didn't know, but I, I, I you do now. Yep. That's it's, you, it was a huge difference in the disposition of my flock. When, when all the roosting bars became level, then yeah, all the problems went away. Yep. It was amazing. Another thing that he did was he had a dropping board underneath that roosting bar or bars, I should say. And it was just a simple matter. He had the, the roosting bars hinged and he just raised them up, yep. tied it with the rope, and he could just scrape out the droppings in short order into the wheelbarrow. Yep. I think everybody's roost bar should be on hinges so you can lift them up and then you know you can get under there, and do your work. Don't you, there's no need to have them attached on both sides, right? You have you can have a support rail, but your actual roosting bar setup should be hinged and you know easily lifted up. You can even put a counterweight on it if you want to sure. hold it up. Sure. But, all hey, right, well, we're, we're getting off in the weeds. Well, I know. I just started to say before we move on to something else, I want to touch on one other thing that folks may not be aware of, and and that's the cause of piling up at night when the birds can see external lights <laughs> that you made, you know, like a street light or something like that can, can foul up a bunch of birds. Real quick. Uh, yeah. Yard light, street light, anything outside, you know, um, I, again, I deal with this, you know, 10 or 12 times a year, you know, people call me and their hens are all piling up in a corner and I'm like, do you have a yard light or a, you know, like an outside light over the driveway or something that they can see? Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, so throughout the night, the hen wakes up just a little bit, right? And, and she'll take a couple steps. And they always gravitate to the last light. So, um, but yeah, inevitably, people that have, you know, like a, a parking lot light in their driveway or something outside, dust of dawn light is what we called them as a kid. <clears throat> um, you know, I'll find all the hens all piled in the corner and then large flocks we get smothering you know and dead birds and that's not a good thing but no um, um so yeah external light is a is a thing um i see a lot of people using plastic you know like greenhouses high tunnels things yeah, like that yeah um you got to make sure that plastic's tight so uh, a little bit of rustling you know if it's a windy night or even a breeze that little bit of plastic rustling you don't believe me go out there with a sheet of plastic right and just rustle it a little bit with your flock and see what they all do right it, they it, don't it, like it it freaks them right out so <clears throat> um if you're going to use plastic as your covering you need to make sure that it's tight and it don't make noise when the wind blows um because that that is a really big stressor actually for birds you know yep. i've lost i've lost thousands of birds because coverings weren't tight, mm. right? Mm -mm -mm. Not just a few, thousands of birds, right? Hey, while we're talking about lights, what about the changes in light? Sudden, <laughs> sudden changes like length of day and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, you know, look, birds are not sun worshipers, so bright, intense lights are never, never, ever bright for a chicken. Okay. If you watch, they'll go out and they'll sunbathe for an hour, you know, half hour to an hour, but 
most of the time you're going to find them in muted light or shade. Yeah. <clears throat> so you, you never want to. So if your 25 watt light bulb in your chicken coop burns out, do not replace it with a hundred watt bulb. Yeah. Okay. Just think about it this way. When you your birds want the light just barely enough that you can walk around in there without tripping over something. Okay. So very low light. So keep your light intensity under control. Don't get carried away. Brighter is not better folks. Um, and then <clears throat> for people that are doing the supplemental light, you know, to stimulate egg lay or keep birds laying, um, any light adjustment. Okay. So proper light adjustment is 30 minutes per week. Okay. Any light change greater than an hour is going to be stressful on those birds as well. Um, I, I deal with a lot of, a lot of people, you know, uh, with cannibalism, pecking, just, you know, severe irritability in their flocks because the lights are too bright, right? That's another drawback to those plastic housing, you know, uh, high tunnels, greenhouses, clear plastic is there's too much light. And actually, once the light gets through the plastic, it kind of refracts in there and reflects all around. Doesn't bother us, but <clears throat> those reflections in there um, with the sensitivity of a chicken's eye it will flips ab it. absolutely drive them crazy. I mean, they'll start killing each other. Uh, it, it'll be carnal in there before you know it. And it just you just need to... You know, you need to kind of understand how a chicken thinks. Um, <clears throat> chicken psychology is a horrible thing, but, <laughs> you know, you got to do it if you're going to keep chickens. Yeah, that's for sure. Hey, we were talking earlier about feed changes, like small changes in appearance or smell. But what about changing birds from, okay, if I'm feeding a man, if I wanted to switch to a pellet, what can I expect from my birds? <laughs> Most of the time, they're not going to accept that change cold turkey, right? So anytime you're making a an appearance change on feed, let's say you want to... You, most most breeding folks or most show folks are, are feeding either a pellet or a crumble, right? And, and let's say you want to go to mash and save a little bit of money or... You want to go to mash because it's more locally available, whatever. Or so because you do Jeff tells you to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, she always throws me under the bus like that. <clears throat> but you can, right, you, you have to do it gradually. So before you run out of pellets, you're doing, you know, like a 60-40 mix, 50-50 mix. You're, you're doing it gradually over 7 to 10 days. So they get used to the appearance of it. They get a chance to taste it. You didn't force feed it to them. But to do it all in, all out, you know, one day to the next, um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna have total disruption out there. You know, going either direction, mash to pellet or pellet to mash, right? It just. <clears throat> all right, let me throw this one at you. I, I know a lot of folks are using a a whole, basically a whole grain mix with a protein pellet in it. But what about any changes? in the grain mix itself where you where you're changing maybe your your ratio of corn and wheat or something like that i mean as long as it's not as like it, it as long as there's still some wheat in there or there's still some corn in there you're fine okay but if you all of a sudden you know you couldn't find corn and you had to go to all wheat you're probably going to get some resistance from your birds right um but that's not as critical. Okay, so they've already been eating the wheat before. They've already been eating the corn before. They've already been eating the oats before. So they're already familiar with the appearance of that. So making those grain ratio changes is not as significant as, you know, what we were talking about before, like going from mash to pellet and back and forth. Gotcha. Right? gotcha. I mean, that's that's a huge change difference there. Um you know, to them, it'd be like you changing colors of your truck. You know what? If you got another Chevy Colorado, but the next time it was blue instead of white, 
You I'd know never what? find it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, they don't really care about so much about that. Um, that's, that's not, but to go, you know, from grains with, you know, different shapes and sizes to all of a sudden everything's exactly the same size um, and color, you know, they're going to have a problem with that. Look, our animals don't really trust us, okay? It takes a long time to build trust between you and your animals. So anytime you change anything, you know, uh, you just kind of deteriorate in that trust factor. And uh, don't don't ever think that your your any of your animals actually trust you. So they're just not really going to be excited about changes. So <clears throat> if it doesn't wiggle or have an excellent smell, you know, like a mealworm or a black soldier fly larva or cricket or something like that, yeah, then they're, they're probably, you're going to have some stress involved there. So, um, yeah, yeah, we talked about pet dogs, but you know, folks, you also got to remember that other predatory animals can also have a negative effect on your birds. Cats, of course, nighttime predators like coons, possums, birds of prey during the day. I, I, I saw a post the other day where somebody has actually pretty much eliminated his aerial predator problem just by putting a crow feeding station out in their yards to attract the crows in because birds of prey usually don't hang around very long where crows are present. Crows will run them off. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> you know, uh, a murder of crows. I wonder how they come up with that name because, you know, a murder of crows will keep just about everything else out of the neighborhood. So, um, what about adding new birds to a flock or changing that flock dynamic with different birds in some way? Yeah, it, it's. It, I don't know about the. I don't know about everybody else that's listening, but you know, look, it, when when my family comes to visit, stays at my house. I can only tolerate it for about three days. Okay. Then it's time to go. All right. Because look, it's disrupted my normal routine. Right. Now I got to share my coffee with somebody in the morning, whatever, you know, you got to wait for the bathroom. So yeah, it's the same thing going on out here is, you know, you bring in new blood or new birds. You now have to reestablish the pecking order. You know, that word, that, that phrase pecking order, you know, it's a real thing. It wasn't made up. Somebody just didn't, you know, pluck it out of their hat somewhere. Um, there is a pecking order. And when you change that social order or that pecking order, it it affects everything from top to bottom. And I, I don't know, you know, if folks have ever heard this before or not, so I'm going to say it. But if, you, if you're going to remove or add birds to a group, it is always best to do it once they've gone to the roost and it's a dark outside, right? When the lights are off in the coop, you know, they're all up on the roost, they're sleeping, <clears throat> you know, you sneak in there with your red headlamp, right? And you place a bird on the roost, you know, for whatever reason, you can't go to bed with a stranger, but you can wake up with one. I don't know how that works in the chicken world, but it does, okay? Your best chance of success is going to be to place them in there in the middle of the night. Okay. After everybody's gone to roost. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And I don't hey. care if you're moving your rooster around for mating. It's still, you're going to be, you're going to have much better success if you do that when it's dark out. Okay? Yep. <clears throat> Let's kind of switch gears a little bit and go to some more uncommon types of stressors. Um, I know one you and I have talked about before is water quality and you know, folks don't, I, ne I used to never give it a, a minute's worth of thought before, but it's a real thing. It is, um, you know, and, and I, I can't, I just cannot get people convinced to get their water tested, right? <clears throat> For what they spend on birds, feed, supplement pens, infrastructure, fences, everything else that they've got going on there, you know, a really good 
water test is somewhere between $75 and $100. And, you know, people will call me, oh, my eggshell color isn't right. My eggshell thickness, my eggs are weak. My eggshells are weak. You know, mm -hmm. I'm having poor breeding. I'm having this. I'm having that, mm -hmm. right? And, <clears throat> you know, okay. In one of the past one of the past shows way back, you know, I talked about, so the number one important environmental aspect is air. The second most important environmental impact is water. Okay. If you don't have good air and you don't have good water, it doesn't matter what we tell you on this show. It doesn't matter what you feed your chickens. It don't matter whether you live in paradise or not. Okay. If you don't have good air and water, you have nothing. So that's how important it is. Where, and I know there's some people out there probably raising their hand with this question, but where's a good place to go to get water tested? I mean, is that something they can do locally, something they got to send it off for? What are your thoughts on that? Usually you're going to send it off, right? Um, sometimes your ag colleges will have something where you can get something that's referred to as a full livestock bundle. So they're going to test the E. coli, uh, coliform um, in the water, you know, so they're going to do a bacteria test to see if it's contaminated, but then you're going to get hardness, pH, things like that. Now, a really good pool, swimming pool store or supply house can do some of those water tests for you, right? Um, I avoid using the water companies, the ones like Culligan and so on that want to sell you a water treatment because That's why I, they feel, do it. I feel like they're going to find something to try and sell you on. Oh, I'm yeah. trying to go to a third party independent, right? Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I'm finding them all over the place. You know, if you look up Waypoint Analytical, um, that's where we send our water test here. W-A-Y? You know, W-A-Y point, P-O-I-N-T waypoint analytical and they've got seven or eight laboratories across the country and you need to read the instructions don't just run some water put it in a bottle and put it in the mail to waypoint okay so um to get an accurate bacteria test reading it has to be received below a certain temperature so you may have to overnight it with ice packs you know to get it there in the proper condition Okay, if you want to get a good test. I'm going to ask Karen, but then I, it wouldn't surprise me. But I'm assuming, Karen, that you've had your water tested. <laughs> um, we do because of the kennel business. That's part of our, we're giving that to the dogs. So gotcha. we do gotcha. keep it tested, yeah. I, I know you're pretty thorough about those <laughs> sorts of things. So. Right. What about, and this is something you mentioned, I don't know if it was, the last show we did or something, but it, it just grabbed my attention and you even commented that you could tell, <laughs> but <laughs> you were talking about here's stray. The, here's the big one. Yep. He waited. Yep. He brought this. He's bringing this one in last. For the no, stray. there's some other things to get. To, okay. But. All right. Yeah. Stray, stray voltage. And so let me give you the definition of stray voltage. And it, it's very common. And if you call your electrical company, they're going to deny it. Um, but in most places, our electrical grid that supplies electric to our houses, to our buildings, to our whatever is antiquated. It's very old. It's not in most places up to speed to handle the amount, um, because, you know, of urban sprawl and everything else, it's not big enough really to supply. So. What we're finding is with the additional amperage going over the lines, the ability for the return wire or the ground wire to get it back to the substation or to get it to return is inadequate. This is this is the most common. Um, and, you know, 20, 30 years ago, actually, when you installed an electrical panel, um, and this is what I was telling Rip, is <clears throat> um, it was perfectly code to bring your white return wire to the same bus bar or connective bar as your ground wire, right? You know, if you go open up your breaker box, right, and you look in there, um, <clears throat> you're going to see your white wire and your plain copper wire coming back to the same, same return. Um, and this, 
most of the time it's probably not a big issue, but it, it causes frequency interruption. And now some of that return voltage doesn't go out to the earth ground the way it's supposed to. Well, and that's the other thing, right? Even here at my house, right? I, I upgraded my electrical panel. I go outside, <clears throat> there's only one grounding rod because that's what the code says. And then when I get to looking even a little closer, it wasn't properly attached, right? Somebody had just, you know, cob job, wrapped the wire around it, right? It, there was not a really good affixed attachment there um, and clamped properly. So, <clears throat> um, so what happens is if, if the voltage you're using or the unused voltage you're using doesn't have a good clear pathway to get back to where it needs to go, um, you end up with amperage that kind of leaks and goes into, and it can be attracted to metal buildings. It can be attracted to hoop buildings, you know, with the large metal, you know, purlins in it. And, um, and, and so while we don't necessarily notice it, you know, it, 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 you don't feel it, you don't see it. And without getting somebody who knows what they're doing with, with the right kind of meter, you're not going to find it. But even milliamps, okay, um, smaller than amps, even residual milliamps um, being absorbed through the soles of the, you know, the, through the bottom of the feet on the poultry or any other animal can give you a wide array of unexplainable health issues right? Whether it's poor fertility, whether it's low egg laying rate, whether it's um, like this strange, uh, no real pattern to mortality, like you're seeing birds die that have no reason why they should have died. Um, so this is a real thing, you know, um, of course, you know, 20, 28 years of doing this, and being in the industry, I've seen multiple, multiple cases of it. Um, you know, for dairy cow operations, I've seen it put people out of business and, you know, they just were unable to be successful in any fashion whatsoever. Perfectly good farmers, but they were never going to make it. And we've had, <clears throat> you know, large scale commercial flocks, you know, actually one of the guys that works for me used to raise commercial broilers, uh, when he had a hot water heater going out because of the additional resistance to the heating coil. Um, it was bleeding off excess amperage into the bedding for the broilers um, and through the through the feed lines and the water lines and the birds wouldn't eat or drink right because they were getting enough voltage through the water line or the feed line that they weren't eating and he was having 30 to 40 percent mortality rates once he figured this out and put a new hot water heater in you know, Shazam, everything went back to just being wonderful, right? Just everything worked great. So it's hard to tell, you know, this is one of those really hidden kind of um, environmental issues that are is hard to put your finger on. There's not a consistent uh, symptom. Um, <clears throat> it's going to vary from place to place because is the voltage, in, you know, is the amperage in the ground? Is it in the feeders? Is it in the waters? And people are saying, well, I use plastic feeders. I'll give you a for instance, okay. Uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I was trying to help a young man start a, a, a raw cow or a raw milk dairy out in Missouri. At his place, he was at the end of an old, old electrical service line. We were actually measuring six volts, okay. Six whole volts, not millivolts, six whole volts at the ground wire coming down the pole it, he was getting because the line was so inadequate um everybody else's you know it, it wanted to come off the pole at his house so where he milked his cows i took my meter along we put a grounding rod outside the barn and inside and then inside the barn i started testing but a rubber mat that the cow stands on a rubber rubber, you know, a really good rubber mat that the cow stands on when she was getting milked, we were measuring over four volts that was seeping through pure rubber. Okay. So 
That's how crazy this is. Now, rubber is typically an insulator, right, Rip? You know, you would not think you're going to measure any type of conductivity or voltage on a rubber or plastic. So don't assume just because it's non-metallic that it's not an issue, right? So, look, and I, I'm not saying that to scare everybody to death, right? But just know that if you have strange, unexplainable health occurrences, especially when they're really random, you know, a couple of these and a couple of those. And, and um, what we what we know is that the amperage will reduce the immune system of any animal and make it less effective. And that's why this is one of the hardest ones to actually pinpoint. Um, you can find it if you get an old type analog, um, you know, voltmeter or amp meter, and that'll go down to milliamps or millivolts, you know, you can actually check it, but that's not, there's not too many of those meters left out there anymore either. And they're kind of special order. They're not cheap, but, but yeah, that was, when I brought that up, it was kind of blowing Rip's mind. What are you talking about? Stray voltage. <laughs> Never heard that term before. So Rip, Rip, you're, mu you're mu muted. You're muted, Rip. I knew that. Yeah. Did I just, you? All right. I, I was you were just testing this? Yeah, you're not testing me. I, I was just going to say that when you told me that, it was sort of like the light went off, but that would be a very bad electrical joke. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, let's, I want to lay one other feed related question well, on now you. Sue, Sue wanted to know if the electric, oh, oh. Or electricity was coming through the water line. Um, Sue, this is, I've seen so many different strange patterns for the for the amperage or the current um one of them was actually so you you never run a, want to run like a propane line you know like a propane supply line beside any type of an electrical line um or even beside a water line right you don't want the two side by side there's something that happens uh, between a propane line and the electrical line, or, and you don't want your electrical line right beside your water line either, you know, uh, directly connected. But the old way of doing it, like uh, putting in a hydrant outside, if you wanted electric out there too, I've seen a lot of water pipes that were wrapped where the electric was actually wrapped right around it. Um, <clears throat> and that, they don't do that anymore. Now it's shielded. Okay. So, but that was, yeah, it was strange stuff. Um, mm. One more food feed related feed question. question. Yep. yep, and that's mycotoxins. What can you tell us about mycotoxins? Oh, you just can't see them, right? Um, so, I mean, we're we're looking at levels down at. Okay, so the government says the, the USDA has established levels for all mycotoxins, what they deem as safe levels. Right now, look, all of the bigger feed companies are buying, they're, they're buying, right? And they're constantly buying grain from all over the place. And they don't really know what they have until it shows up, right? So they get a rail, they get, you know, people like Cargill are getting 100 rail cars of corn every day, right? And yeah, okay, so they get it there. You know, they have their own little in-house kind of mini lab. They test it for these things. You know, this one gets flagged as being too hot, so they'll run it to this bin, and this one's really good, and they'll run it to this bin, so they'll get them to average under that USDA guideline, right? And um, But so, you know, we're fighting, if people really don't want to sleep tonight, go to the Biomin website, you know, B-I-O, B-I-O-M-I-N, Biomin has been spot checking crops all over the world okay for at least five years if not longer and they're doing mycotoxin te my mycotoxin testing around the world north america south america europe you know everywhere <clears throat> and you can read the reports but our grain supply worldwide primarily because of our new farming practices our quality of grain or our mycotoxin, you know, it is 
the mycotoxins are on increase, the quality is on a decrease, right? <clears throat> so, you know, everybody's selling something to bind these and keep them under control and, you know, so they don't affect animals or they're in that safe level and whatever. So it, it's, it, I'm not going to the Biomin website tonight because it'll freak you out, right? I mean, it just, it, it'll scare the crap out of you. And so mycotoxins just, so mycotoxins are, so after a fungus or a mold or a bacteria lives on the grain, does its thing, right? When it dies off, it leaves behind a chemical compound. You might as well call it uh, fungus poop, okay? So what's left behind is a mycotoxin. Well, that <clears throat> chemical compound will reduce immune system, it'll cause birds to quit eating, right? It does a whole lot of things. It, it definitely is going to affect your fertility, your hatch rate, your chick vigor. Um, it, it, you're gonna see reduced feed intake. Um, I've seen really severe cases where even birds as dumb as a Cornish cross, right? A commercial Cornish cross. We're sorting out corn, nice big golden chunks of corn and throwing them on the ground, okay? Anybody in their life ever seen a chicken waste a nice big chunk of corn? Not gonna happen, right? This farmer sent me a picture, here's piles. There's 10 pounds of corn sitting around the outside ring of this feeder on the ground. And I told him, I said, Charlie, you gotta get your, you gotta get this tested for mycotoxins. Oh, you're crazy, you're full of shit. You've lost your mind, Jeff, you know, just, just. I said, look, you send it off. If I'm wrong, I'll pay for the test. Okay. All right. So he sends it off, it comes back hotter than hot, right? He puts in fresh corn. He got fresh corn with no mycotoxins on it. Ground a batch of feed. Those birds turned around overnight. They at they ate like he had starved them the first four weeks of their lives. I can right? believe it. Yeah. Right. Because eating those mycotoxins was thrown off the digestive tract. It was, it was giving them a belly ache. Right. So most of the people listening at some, some point has eaten something that's given them food poisoning. Right. You get diarrhea, yep. you get all off. And uh, that's basically what we're talking about. It's a slow poisoning effect that occurs over time, builds up in the system. Um, it's making the liver work over time to try and filter it out of the blood. Digestive tract's not working 100 percent, you know, so everything just goes problem is, is depending on the level of the mycotoxin, if you've got two or three parts per million now, thinking about parts per million, three parts per million, you know, it's going to take a month or two for you to start seeing the side effects. Now, if you got 10 parts per million, you're going to see side effects within seven to 10 days. Okay. So it, you don't know what you're getting in the feed. And I'm not trying to scare people away from their feet, right? It's going to, it's out there. The horse is already out of the barn. We're not going to get it back in. But just be aware of, you know, if you see chickens wasting a lot of feed, especially if it's the same grain, so to speak, you know, just, just, you know, think about getting it tested right now. Unfortunately, a, a mycotoxin test is scary to people because it's, anywhere from 80 to hundred dollars to get a test done. And you know, that's a lot of money, right? And you're kind of guessing that that what, that's what it might be. And it might be, and it might not be. So <clears throat> I don't know, but it's out there. It's a real thing. Um, you know, I've been fighting it for 15 or 20 years and you know, some of you have seen me recommend uh, Redmond clay. You can pick it up. It's a uh, calcium bentonite clay from Utah. It's a really clean source. You know, we can add a little bit to the water. It soothes the gut. It gets everything back. It binds to the mycotoxin, gets it out of there so it doesn't affect the bird. So, <clears throat> but don't, now don't everybody go order Redmond conditioner or Redmond clay and start feeding it because you're worried about it but it's um, just be aware it's there if you really really need it yeah i've got a few things that i want to talk about and this is primarily for 
the show poetry people, but some of you may find this interesting. And, and it's just some points of things to think about when you're showing your birds. First off, your birds are going to be bombarded with strange sounds. Uh, if they're, if you're not used to having them in a show in these barns, and, and Jeff and Karen can attest to this, just having come back from the Ohio National, that sound in there, even with the sound panels on the wall, was just kind of bouncing around 80 different directions. But strange sounds, strange birds, strange people. You know, Jeff was talking about this earlier. Different people. And some of these different people are wearing show coats and judges coats. Um so just think about what you can do to prepare your birds for those types of situations. You know, strange sounds. I downloaded uh, an audio file. I've got it somewhere. So if any of you want it, I'll be happy to share it. Uh, that was recorded inside a show barn. You can play that on a continuous loop. Makes a difference. Strange birds. When you're show training your, uh, coop training your birds, Mix up the order of the birds. Don't always have the same birds standing beside the next one. Mix it up so they're used to having different birds next mm -hmm. to them. Uh, strange people, get family or friends to come in there and look at them and stand there and stare at them. Uh, show coats, wear your show coat. Simple. Get them used to being handled. Um, they're going to show their best if, if they're accustomed to being handled. You pull a bird straight out of the pen and haul it off to a show nine <laughs> times out of ten it's going to freak out so just get your birds used to being handled um, another one jeff talked about the importance of how birds would recognize the difference in feed and water and the effects that it had on them i always take my own feed and my own water to the show and i go a step further i take the same cups food and water cups that they're accustomed to when I'm coop training them, uh, some shows provide feed and water cups. Some folks don't. And a lot of the folks that provide them are these little bitty Dixie cups. Uh, folks, a big single cone cockerel can't get in there to eat or drink. So I make sure I, I take the feed and water cups that they're used to. There's going to be a lot of cameras and flashes going off. Get in there when you're coop training your birds with your cell phone and just take photos, get them accustomed to it. Travel time. If you're going to be on the road for long distances, for long periods of time, you need to build in some feed and water stops along the road. You know, uh, I know some folks came from a long ways off to come to the Ohio national and, and everybody I talked to, Oh yeah, they, they build in those feed and water stops not only for themselves, but for their birds as well. Uh, and Jeff helped me out here, but one thing that occurred to me today, and this is true, especially some crested breeds, they're very flighty. And I say crested breeds because of, they get some of these big crests and, and basically the birds are blind and, and you can reach in, you can stand in front of the cage, doesn't bother them to go about their business. But as soon as you put your hand in that coop where they can see out from one of those feathers, boom, they get all excited. Yep. Would it be a good idea to add some B vitamins prior to the show and during the show? You can, but you got to be careful. Okay. So a little B vitamin is calming, mm -hmm. but if you go above a certain threshold on your B vitamins, it acts as a stimulant. All right. So just, you know, I, I want to say yes to what you just asked Rip, but I know somebody's going to go out there and give a bird a shot yeah, of B12. That's no, that's right? not going to work. Right. So, <clears throat> um, what, what you said is true, right? But a little bit is good and a lot is not. So, it's just uh, all things in moderation, you know. And, and uh, I, I got to find the guy's name, but he went to the Iowa State Fair out there and he did very well. Right. And, and he mixed up the, the vinegar, molasses, ginger, and salt mix, mm -hmm. you know, the, the electrolyte mix. Yeah. And the birds, you know, uh, they dealt with the stress a whole lot better. Right. They, they made, he, he gave it to them before they left. He gave it to them as soon as they arrived. You know, he was using it throughout the show. 
And he said, you know, it managed their stress level. They stayed on feed. You know, they, they, their appetite stayed the same. Everything was good, right? So he was extremely impressed with, you know, how it was working with those birds. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up because that was actually the next thing on my list to, to check yeah. with you about. So right. you done it's, good there, buddy. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I, I'm not, there's, there's a lot of weird stuff in Gatorade. You know, if you really read the label, Ooh, you know, there's, there's, yeah. Um, so it's, and I saw Gatorade in watering cups at the yep. Ohio national. And yep. I'm like, what are you people doing? And, yep. and you know what? They didn't know any different, right? So no, they don't, you know, but <clears throat> they haven't been listening to you. That's the problem. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> they just need to know there's better choices out there. Right. Um, but one, one other thing I want to mention, and, and then we'll get Karen to pop some questions up. And I noticed it with Sue Dobson's bird at the Ohio national, and I've got a photo of it, but at the Ohio national, they had double stacked coops. They had large fowl down on the bottom and bantam coops, like a sheet of plywood or something over the on top of the large fowl coop and set bantam coops on top of that with bantams in it. Which, there's nothing wrong with that. But Sue's bird, occasionally I would see him doing the same thing that I see 98% of the other birds because they're not used to having something over their head. Okay. They want to kind of hunker down and they'll they'll suck their head and neck in and they'll they'll also drop their tail because it's stressing them out because they're not used to that. If you don't do anything else, just get some pieces of cardboard and lay on top of your large fowl cages if you're working with large fowl. Just something to think about. That's my two cents. Just to get them used to being shadowed or under yeah. something. So, yeah. 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 Especially if they're used to an open top type pen. Oh, yeah. They're not. Yeah. And that's the way most of our birds are. They're in these open pens, you know. Yeah. But I learned a ton at the Ohio National. So, you know, seeing just being there. It, it was amazing. So for those who didn't go, I'm sorry, but I was happy to meet everybody that was there. Absolutely. So. All right, Karen, what do we got for questions? All right. <clears throat> Some of these go back to the beginning, but that's okay. Um, no. All right. Uh, so Rob wants to know if it's a stress to the birds even if you're shifting from a feed that your birds love the flavor of to a less tasty feed that's better for them. You're going to, Rob, you're still going to have to do it gradually. Sorry. Um, I, I, I want you to get on that better feed as quick as you can. Um, but you know, you, you need to do this over the course of seven to 10 days by blending the two together and they will be, you know, They'll be better for it in the end, but yeah, it's, um, you, you still got to do it gradually because you don't want them to go off feed, right? We don't want them to miss a few meals. And so <clears throat> that's the best way to handle it. Yep. Hello, Kitty. Um, so John's having some wonderful winter weather. Um, <laughs> and he pretty much, he believes it's been stressing out his flock. What do you think? Well, I know he's been without electricity there for about 24 hours. Just. <laughs> yesterday but uh, I, I don't i don't know how much it's stressing the flock out versus how much it's stressing john out um you know the birds we were talking before the show i i never did anything supplemental for my birds until we got below 20 degrees okay as far as he's way up there don't you think he's probably below 20 degrees? oh i don't know you know he probably is because we actually you know the thermometer on my truck going driving to work said 23 this morning which is really mm. cold for us in november but <clears throat> um you know just a, a little bit of molasses in the water helps a lot to relieve stress i have no idea why don't don't ask me i just know that molasses a small amount of molasses can be a great mm -hmm. stress reliever um you know distractions uh in, in in John's case, snow with the big uh, barometric pressure changes when the big snowstorms come in, it does make the birds a little bit more nervous and flighty. They can feel it in their bones, right? Even if they can't see it. 
um, so they will become a little bit more stressed. So I, I'm going along with the birds are a little bit of stressed. They should have leveled out today, you know, if the snow quit, but it's, um, but yeah, there's not, I mean, just keep the lights muted if you can. Don't, not too much, not too much bright lights and, you know, try and keep them calm. Give them a flake of hay or something to peck at and be happy. So, um, so Rob says that you talked a little bit about predators and other disturbance, but the, Rob had a skunk getting into his coops. Um, that that drove his birds a little bit crazy. Skunks yeah. can get in, they can <laughs> dig in, it doesn't take a big hole, and they will flip you out if you ever encounter one in your poultry coop. Been there, yeah. done that. Yeah, no fun at all. No fun at all. Just don't, Rob, don't overreact. So I used to have a neighbor and he used to box trap skunks and he would actually talk to him like it was a pet cat or something, you know, uh, you know, here, kitty, kitty. And he'd talk to it very gently and he was able to walk up to it without getting sprayed. And he would euthanize these skunks literally with an ice pick, um, you know, a, a, a oh. long, a long sharpened screwdriver. And if he got them through the ear and into the brain, you know, um, they wouldn't, they wouldn't scent, they wouldn't spray. Okay. So he wanted to capture the scent glands because he had a market for the skunk scent glands. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I thought my neighbor was half crazy anyway, that he just confirmed it at that point. But, <laughs> you know, but he actually would, you know, box trap them. Uh, have a heart box trap them and then euthanize them, you know, with a long pointy instrument. And he did it all the time. So he was braver than I am. I'm not getting that close to, one. I know I agree with you, but you know, he <laughs> confirmed it. I, I've seen it. He did it. It was real. So if you talk to him in a calm voice, they won't spray you. Just <laughs> don't overreact and scream. Right. You're okay. I'd so. be hard pressed to have a calm voice at that point. Yeah. All right, Laura's going to put the copper in the water and this weekend and see how it goes. I'm, I'm still doing it. I'm still happy with it. So, yeah, makes a difference. Yeah. Really does. Okay. Um, Rob wants to know if they allow for higher level of my mycotoxins in deer corn or wild bird. Feed. Yeah, I was hoping you were going to put that up. I saw it in the comment block, and I did want to talk about <laughs> it. Um, Rob, they they. Okay, so the USDA sets safe limits, but they are not monitoring it, okay? So the feed companies don't have to follow it. They just, the USDA says five parts per million on Don Wamatoxin and this many parts per million on Alphalotoxin, et cetera. Um, the feed companies have no legal requirement whatsoever to follow it. Now, I, I'm going to... Uh, you know, the people that are putting out deer corn and wild bird seed don't care one bit. And um, I'm hearing out of those industries that a lot of times those have the higher levels of mycotoxins in them. So just be really careful. And the pelleting process. So look, the mycotoxin is not a living organism. So it does not kill it so you're not going to kill a mycotoxin it's already a chemical compound that's on the grain or in the grain um, <clears throat> we do see that pelleting and roasting of grains will reduce the mycotoxins but it does not take them completely out right um, usually the mycotoxin is is excreted by the fungus and it's on the external you know, the cuticle or the external part of the grain. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, so the pelleting or the roasting, um, it will, you know, some of it will uh, come off, but there's still going to be some there. So. All right. You guys did your job today. <laughs> That's it. Fulfilled Good your grief. duties. We got off light. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know that hour. That hour and five minutes went pretty quick. So it did. It really did. Yeah. Well, you know, Jeff and Karen, I appreciate y'all so much, and and all you do to make this show possible. And uh, I appreciate all of our listeners who are watching with us uh, tonight, and those who will see this on replay. You know, you guys are why we do this, and we just sincerely want to help you have 
a better, happier, healthier poultry flock. Uh, that's our our goal in life is to help you folks. So thank you again for watching. Before we go, I just want to remind you about the Poultry Keepers podcast that comes out every Tuesday morning, bright and early at 12.01 a.m. So if you're an early riser, you got something to while away a little bit of time while you're having your morning cup of coffee. So until we come back in two weeks, be sure and enjoy your birds. Have a fun time and get ready for Christmas. Thank you all. Bye-bye. See you all.